We, we cannot use the word we rise when other people are falling. Mm. It has to be all of us. And I, I've, I've always made this known that this campaign is not about me. It wasn't about me. It's not about me. And it's never going to be about me. It's about all of us. Because when you have someone who is the voice of people who have been forgotten, it means that I would go into Congress with a moral responsibility to think about the people who put me in office. Welcome to another edition of Break the Code. My name is Nayan Defru and I'm your host. Today we're breaking the code with Gabriel Njinimbot. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. It's nice to be here. I'm so excited to have you. Um, so Gabriel is running for Congress. Yes. And super, when I saw a campaign flyer, I was like, this name <laughs> who is this right and then i dug and found out that you're from cameroon yes uh, how long have you been living in the states i have been here for a little bit over two decades awesome just a little bit slightly over two decades i came in in 99 mm -hmm. uh, straight from cameroon awesome okay well, once again welcome to the show thank you um we're going to be talking about your journey to running for Congress. Mm -hmm. So how about you uh, tell the audience a little bit about yourself? So like you rightly mentioned, you yeah. found out, I am originally from Cameroon. Um, I was raised in a small town there in Cameroon, in Bali to be precise. Mm -hmm. and Bali, Nyonga. Cameroon, not Bali, Indonesia. Right, okay. yeah, that's, <laughs> that's it. I used to get confused with that too. Right. But, um, I'm from Cameroon and I was raised in that small town by parents mm -hmm. who were not lucky enough to see the four walls of an elementary school. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, we are about 19 in our family. 19? Children. <laughs> okay. Yes. It's a polygamous home. and uh, But my parents did sacrifice everything they had or could to ensure that we have some form of an, of, uh, an education. Okay. And I did graduate from the University of Boya in 1997. Okay. And then um, some family friends, and I was lucky enough to be helped by them to move to the United States in 1999. Wow. Okay. So what did you study in the University of Boya? Actually, my major was educational administration. Interesting. And a minor in history. Okay. But when I completed the university, I took a series of computer classes mm -hmm. um, before I came over here. Okay. And I came here to study uh, education in the University of Akron in Ohio. Oh. Yes. Okay. My family is from Ohio. So. Oh, great. Yes. Great, great state. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So you have, you're interested in education. That's your thing. Yes. But you have this computer science type background. Yeah. A little more about that. I was really interested in computers mm -hmm. uh, from Cameroon right after I graduated from college, but it was so expensive at that time okay. that I couldn't afford it. Right. right after I left college, I sold clothes on the streets of the university I left from. I actually wrote this in my, my autobiography. Um, I went to Mache Kululu. I bought women's clothes and T-shirts and shirts came right back to the gate to the university. I sold it over there. And um, it wasn't very easy, mm -hmm. you know, not much money made because I wanted to take this computer class or classes. It was also very expensive. So I decided to do self-study. Okay. And then through that, I, I went back and helped some of the students who were, who were studying in that university. I mean, in that uh, computer school. Wow. And then, yeah. <laughs> and then... Uh, so when I came to the States, I picked up, up on the IT um, field. Mm -hmm. And again, just coming from Cameroon, I had just $100 on me, the, the person who helped me come here. Gave me 100 bucks. came to O'Hare in Chicago. It's a very big airport, as you know, compared yes. to 
the one we have in Cameroon, in Douala. <laughs> and um, it took me four hours to figure out where the heck I was. Yeah. And in the course of that, I missed a flight that was connecting to my school. And then uh, finally spent the night at a hotel. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't have done so because I used up the hundred bucks I had. Oh my. Yeah. <laughs> I should have just stayed by behind <laughs> at the airport. At the airport. But fortunately, I met this uh, American who was so gracious to me to, you know, ask where I was coming from. He saw I was visibly exhausted and, and tired. So he asked where I was from. I said, I'm from Cameroon. He's like, where are you going? I said, I'm going to the University of Akron. Like, do you know anybody there? I said, no, nope. it's my first time stepping foot in the United States. And he was so kind to drive me or give me a ride from the airport to the university wow. of Akron. Yeah, somebody I met for the very first time. It's incredible. It is incredible. Yeah. And um, I was so grateful for that. And we got to the university and the university was closed. And because it was a Sunday. Oh. So he said, uh, I feel so terrible. I have to leave you on the street corners, but I can't take you to my house. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know what? Thank you very much for at least bringing me all the way to the university. But he said, you don't know anybody here. The school is closed, so I can't let you stay here. Do you know anyone in the country? Mm -hmm. So I said, I have my cousin who is in Washington, D.C., and that's how I came up to D.C. And oh. uh, yeah. Okay, so you left from Akron to D.C.? Yes, so I came from Akron to D.C., uh, with the hope of going back, mm -hmm. but uh, things did change, and I picked up a job at a seafood restaurant in College Park, Maryland, uh, cleaning dishes and working in the kitchen, bossing tables for about a year and a half. Mm -hmm. Then I took computer classes again. Okay. Uh, Oracle, it was it was the Oracle boom at the time, right, database administration, right, right, right. and I was fortunate to. Uh, pass those certifications, obtained my first job in the IT industry at that time, mm. and uh, you know had a job in corporate. And at the same time, I I, so I did spend two years in the district I'm running for Congress in right now. Okay. And another 18 years in Baltimore City, which is the 29th largest city in the country. Yeah. And while there, I also went to law school, mm -hmm. and I had my law degree, and opened up a couple of small businesses, and I have a family, a beautiful wife, and three children. One of them is actually going to Towson University in 25 days. Oh. So. Wow. That's incredible. What an Thank incredible you. journey. Um, so you didn't set out to study law, but it just became part of the journey Law has always been one thing I wanted to do okay. when I came to the country. Mm -hmm. But then I say, as an immigrant, you know how complicated and difficult it is to integrate in the United States, you know, trying to figure out, you know, what should you do professionally? Do you have documents and things like that? So I couldn't do it that very first few years. Okay. But when I worked and had my foot on the ground, I said, I need to go back and get my law degree so I can better understand how the country works and how things are getting done, especially so I shouldn't get myself in trouble. <laughs> um, now everybody is going to law school to make sure they don't get in trouble. So I, I think it's, it's it, beyond, beyond staying that. out of trouble, yeah. right? Um, but, um, Gabriel, you... You... Um, transitioned from education to computer science to law mm -hmm. along the journey did people say well, what are you doing why why are you making so many changes that's a i i relate to this because i'm that kind of person i do a lot of different things but i'm just curious what that journey has been like for you that's that's a fantastic question. I've I've had people call me crazy. And now running for Congress, <laughs> you know. So <laughs> yes, we'll get to that. Um, but my whole journey since I came to this country has been very very audacious. This is so many things I've tried, and every time I tried these things, 
people thought I was crazy. Mm -hmm. And probably rightfully so. <laughs> I was naively doing certain things, but yeah. it's just because of who I am and in the country I believe in that anything you try, it's possible if you put your mind to it. Okay. I would tell you one, maybe two of the many stories that have actually been crazy. People that have been crazy, okay. including me running for one of the most powerful uh, legislative branches of government on the planet. Mm. So I'm, mentally, I'm very, very entrepreneurial. Yeah. I like to try things to put some food and make money and put some food on the table. So when I, when I saved up some money after working in the IT industry for my first few years, I thought I needed to open a business, but I didn't know exactly what it was. Okay. So I ran into an auto garage shop to do some vehicle repairs and maintenance. And the guy told me he was selling his garage, um, thinking, you're talking <laughs> to the wrong guy here. <laughs> but he was so convincing that I started thinking about it. Okay. And for three months, I thought about, hmm, maybe I should buy this garage. So I picked a couple of family members who are close to me, mm -hmm. and I sampled their opinion. Say, hey, there's this garage that's been sold over there. They repair vehicles and things like that. What do you think if I was to buy it? Wait, what? what? Your, your background is IT and education. Now what you are you trying to buy yeah. a garage? <laughs> what are you trying you to do? You want to be a mechanic? <laughs> and, and honestly, mentally, I'm not wired to be a mechanic. Right mentally mm -hmm. uh not that there's anything wrong with that not profession but we can't we all can't survive without without them but then after a couple of months i decided to go buy this garage and only one person out of the 10 people told me to try it so go ahead and do it the worst thing you're going to do is lose money right so i bought it but it was one of the most I don't want to say wrong decision, but it was one of the most daring things I ever did. Okay. Because from, actually remember the dates, from the 8th of January to the 20th of June, it was a complete nightmare. In, in what way? In, it, because of the fact that the garage did not work the way I thought it was going to work. Okay. First of all, I learned a couple of lessons from this for anybody who is listening and wants to be a, an entrepreneur or open up a small business. Mm -hmm. My advice, my recommendation is don't start your business, especially service-oriented business, businesses in the cold season, at least in this region. Mm. There's a lot of reasons for that. And if you ask most entrepreneurs, they will tell you that the business is relatively slow between November and March. And I have witnessed this since 2008 up to now. So do you still have that business? Well, I'll get to that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so the reason is, before I go back, the reason is because in November there's Thanksgiving, mm -hmm. there's Christmas coming up, there's New Year's coming up. People spend so much money with family. Right. And they only spend it on things that are necessary. And until tax season, people don't spend that much money. Mm -hmm. And I see this every day in my current business and, and everything else. So between, going back to the story, between January and June, I tried to sell this garage for $5. Nobody wanted it. <laughs> you, were you, <laughs> you were $5 done. You were $5 because... Wow, did why didn't I know out. you then? <laughs> I know, right? It did not work out. The guy who sold the garage to me mm -hmm. was working okay. as the mechanic. Oh. And I had to pay him $1,000 every week. But we never made $200 every week. So on June 28th of that same year, I decided to change that same garage into a used tire store. Okay. And it was, it was a miracle. Wonderful. It was so, the best decision that we made. Pivot. Yes. I, I, your story resonates with me because one, when I graduated college, I joined the military. Oh, wow. Yes, I was in the military. Thanks for that service. Absolutely. It was a pleasure to serve, honestly. I enjoyed my time of service. But while I was in the military, 
I used to buy clothes from New York and purses and stuff. And I had a little stand in the PX where I sold those things as well to make extra money. So, and also when I was in school in Cameroon, um, it was a time of, you know, when the value of the CFA had gone down. Mm -hmm. Um, My mom and I used to make plantain chips and we would package them and I'd take them to school and sell. And um, I think a lot of times we look at these little experiences and don't recognize how much value they have in developing character and helping us, you know, shape our thinking along the way. Mm -hmm. Um, So, yeah, so I was like, you're my people. (laughs) You're my people. Yeah. Yeah. So we did switch from the garage Mm -hmm. to the tire store. I actually wrote this in my autobiography for anybody who wants to get more detailed. Where can we find your autobiography? It's on Amazon. Okay. It's one of my five published publications. Okay. It's all on Amazon if you're watching. Yeah, we didn't include that in the bio. <laughs> in the <laughs> intro, right. he's also a published author. Yes, of so five books. Yeah. Um, and then we switched that out to the a used tire store. And it was the best decision we made. Okay. And that was in June. Fast forward a year, we opened up a second location. And it did very well all the way up to 2015, 2016. And then everybody starts opening a tire shop, okay. which is good for the economy. Yeah. But then things took a nosedive when it, because it was several options. Mm-hmm. Then we pivoted again and we decided to open, or I decided to open a ballroom for events, mm-hmm. all kinds of assemblies you can think of, baby showers, birthday celebrations, graduations, wakekeepings, and, and so on. Okay. And in the then, same space. In the same space. So it was just this transformation from a garage to a tire store to a... An event center. center. Yeah, essentially. And we have two locations. We opened up two locations okay. uh, as, as time went on. But besides all of that, we've opened a U-Haul franchise, a tag and title service for the state of Maryland, a notary service, a computer school, uh, and so on. Oh, wow. Okay. So we need to bring you back on to talk about entrepreneurship. Yes. But this is why we need people like you in Congress, right? Because I feel like the for people who are making ch- changes, pivoting, after COVID, so many people said, maybe it's time to reevaluate. Yeah my life and the things I'm doing and things that bring me joy, Mm -hmm. um, how much time I spend with my family and what are the things that allow me to be present or not. And entrepreneurship is a great segue for a lot of people, but a lot of people really struggle because a lot of that information is really, while there are great resources out there, a lot of that information is not really public knowledge. Is that something when I was reading about you, I know that entrepreneurship it's a big deal, but I didn't realize how deep we were yeah. going. Um, how do you see entrepreneurship in terms of representing your, you know, your, the district? What do you think about entrepreneurship? Great question. Area? One of my priorities uh, amongst the many is entrepreneur, increased entrepreneurship in the, in the district. Now, statistically, this county has lots of immigrants. Right. Lots of them from all parts of the world. And a lot of them are entrepreneurs, including myself. And being in that domain, I understand fully what it means to keep open. Wait, what it means to open, keep your business running for a minimum of five years. The first few years are always very, very difficult. Right. And I think that being in Congress, you have to have an understanding of what it means to keep an economy running. And small businesses play a very, very important role in keeping not just the district, the state, as well as the whole country running. I call it running the engine of the country is done by small businesses. Mm. Now, <clears throat> you know that during the COVID time, the government did something to help small businesses. Yes. I think we should have more of that because without these small businesses, there will be less jobs 
uh, less jobs uh, in the economy, most families will not be able to provide income for themselves or take care of their own kids, send them to school, or save money for retirement or take a vacation. Mm -hmm. But you have to have a full understanding of what it means to open a business and also to make policies that don't affect the businesses in an adverse uh, way. I'll give you a couple of examples. In my current establishment, we have a liquor license. And in order for you to obtain a license to sell liquor in, in the state or anywhere else, it is a very complex and rigorous process that keeps most people away just by reading what the requirements are. I think that we could, we could keep people safe and encourage people to open more businesses and still make the rules and regulations a little bit relaxed because there's a lot of people who want to be entrepreneurs, but the policies and procedures are so, so stiff right. that it creates a bottleneck for Absolutely. anybody who wants to open a business. And I think it's important to be culturally sensitive, right? Yeah. Like coming from the perspective of an immigrant, representing an area that has so many immigrants, there are certain things that an immigrant business caters to that a non-immigrant business does not. That is correct. And having someone with the same background who's faced the same challenges and has overcome some of them, right? There's always a challenge, right. but has overcome some of them. It's really important. It's really important for the people. Mm -hmm. It's important for the country. It is. Yeah. So when, again, when I saw that you were running, I was like, okay. We, we need to talk to him. Um, what are some other things that are really important to you as you're running for Congress that you think are important to this district that require Gabriel's perspective? So I will start with immigration laws. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I understand most members of Congress, they, they say and they've always claimed that they do understand what immigrants go through. I don't think anybody would understand what it takes for an immigrant to leave their country, leave their families, brave in some cases the jungles of South America and the high seas, the Mediterranean, yeah. to try to leave the country. But they do so because they believe in America. Mm -hmm. When I was young, I had a perspective about this country. And it, it, it meant a whole lot to me if I were ever going to come to America. And fortunately for me, I did come through. But most of us travel thousands of miles away to come to this country just to work, make life better for ourselves, our children, and our families, be it either here or, or outside the country. Right. However, we need to relax immigration laws such that I don't have to sit on the bench for 10 years before I become a US citizen. When you know I have no criminal background, no criminal records, I've worked and paid my taxes, I'm, I'm providing or serving some, some aspect of the community, community service. Mm -hmm. We should not make the laws that stiff and that long. And I know we could do this because we aid foreign countries with billions and trillions of dollars. Absolutely. And I will get to that when, um, as I move on to the next thing that I'm very passionate about education. Yeah. One reason why I'm standing here talking to you, we're having this conversation with anybody else who's watching, mm -hmm. is because my parents, even though they were not lucky to obtain an elementary school knowledge or education, right. they sacrificed everything for us to be educated. Mm -hmm. My expectation for this district, the state and the country, is that we should provide equal opportunity for everyone who is willing and able to go to school. Do you think that there is not equal opportunity right now? I believe it's not. Okay, give me an example. I'll give you a ton of examples. Okay. Uh, one, if we may, we, we shouldn't classify or categorize schools that would segment rich kids to be in certain schools and rich kids mm -hmm. and the other non-rich or poor kids to be in public schools. And I see this, we see this across the, con the, the country, so to speak, where 
uh, if you don't belong to a certain class, you cannot send your kid to a private school because those private schools at elementary, high, or even middle schools cost as much as college, college. tuition. And even more. <laughs> and we live in the yeah. same county, in the yeah. same district. Yeah. That shouldn't be the case. Mm -hmm. Now, PG County has 209 public schools. Okay. My plan is to visit all of these schools if I can. I've been to a good number of them already. The stories are all different, but it boils down to the same issues that all the kids are facing. Most likely because most of the kids in this in this district are immigrant children. Mm. Now, this is public knowledge. Statistics has shown that the kids are still struggling in math at an eight percent proficiency. Eight percent. Reading at a 24% proficiency and graduating at 76%, which has actually gone down from 79% in the past five academic school years. Wow. Why is that? All of us are here because of our teachers. We're not paying the teachers as they should. Mm -hmm. The schools are really overcrowded. Mm -hmm. The teachers have no incentive. Talk to them and you would, you would, you would hear them say, it. we have the resources to do this. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you why. We spend $300 million a day to keep the Taliban at bay in Afghanistan. $300 million. In 20 years, that was $2.2 trillion. Okay? Yeah. $800 billion of that was the cost of the direct war. We left $7, million, no, $7 billion of equipment in Afghanistan before we left. Okay? Yeah. We started building roads and infrastructure and hotels for the uh, people who were supposed to serve the war over there, and we never used it. In terms of life cost, mm -hmm. there were 4,000, 4, 2,500 servicemen who died in Afghanistan, 4,000 civilian contractors. And on the Afghan citizens, about 70,000 citizens, and the enemies were about 50,000 of them who were killed. With all that money, if you combine that with the money spent in Afghanistan, in Iraq, it's estimated by Forbes and Brown University that it would cost you and I, the taxpayers, and maybe the children right now who are not able to graduate from school, $6.5 trillion by 2035. With all this money we spend outside of the country, in foreign aid, fighting wars, which in some cases we shouldn't be fighting, we shouldn't be there. Mm -hmm. Why are our teachers in this district, in this state, in the country, using their own pocket money to buy, supplies. to buy school supplies? Why do we have to have a congressional hearing when it comes to that? Why can't we aid the schools? Why can't we pay the teachers more? Why can't we pay our veterans even more? Why can't we pay our police officers more? Why can't we pay our firefighters more? Firefighters are known to spend 48 hours at work because there's nobody to relieve them because nobody wants to be a firefighter because they don't get paid that well. Right. So there is a lot that can be done in the district. But this can't be done easily because most politicians, most politicians in this district, in the state, across the country, take money from special interest groups. Okay. Lobbying companies, Wall Street, big banks, big corporations. And guess what? They have to so fight for them, not for the ordinary job. For their interests, not for our teachers and firefighters and all these people you've mentioned. Um, well, that's impressive, all the statistics that you gave us. I have uh, more, but... <laughs> um, I think... In, this is why, you know, representation is important because you know the stories of, I mean, going to 209 Nine schools, schools yeah. is part of your journey Almost, to yeah. uh, Congress, which is super exciting. I think about where we live, um, and it's not just that the, the difference between private schools and public schools if you're in a public school that is highly funded by people with 
larger amounts of wealth, it's usually a better school. Yeah. So there, I do see the importance of having some form of intentional integration yeah. um, because if we're not intentional, there can be no change. Exactly. Right. And just so I, can, I should add to this, uh, PG County was known uh, some decades back. What's not known? It was the most influential black county in the entire country. It was the second in the state. When Wayne Curry was county exec for PG County, okay. there was an influx of small businesses, uh, tech folks, uh, you know, people from all walks of life flowing into PG County because it was one of the best countries in the uh, counties in the whole in the whole country. But in the past decade, more than 500,000 people have moved out of the, out of the county to neighboring Charles County. Okay. And now Charles County has taken over that position as the number one influential black county in the, in the state and in the country. And I think that PG County has everything it takes to gain back that, stat that status. We have lots of abandoned buildings that we can knock down. Mm -hmm. We have old telephone booth that was there 20 years ago. It's still hanging around some of the streets. We could take those off and replace them with charging stations for electric vehicles because that's the way we're heading to anyways. Yeah. By then we create jobs, you know, give opportunities for other people to grow yeah. and things like that. So it's important for us to have a completely new perspective and new energy when it comes to changing the status quo in our district. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, in Congress, you still have people in Congress who are 90 years of age <laughs> on wheelchairs. Right. They should give a chance to other people who are willing and able to do the work they're doing. Right. And we're so quick to talk <laughs> about the African dictators. Exactly. But hello. How different is that? Look at um, 90 year olds in Congress. Yeah. So it's time for some new energy, right? So don't complain about Paul Bia who's in Cameroon <laughs> for decades. Yes. If you can't, it's me. If Mitch McConnell. Uh, Diane Feinstein and a whole bunch of them can't give up their personal <laughs> positions to somebody else. Exactly. It makes absolutely no So we want to change this perspective of things, give the chance to younger folks in the district, because I know there are many of us, right. many people who are willing and able to serve. Mm -hmm. But, and this will lead me to my next issue, money and politics. I did not realize this until I started campaigning and trying to raise funds. Mm -hmm. then I realized why people cannot run for office because it's a full-time job, it's very expensive. You have people who are pouring in millions to your opponents to run for the office. Right. So it makes it really, really challenging. Uh, but I'm willing to take on a course mm. and be the voice of these voiceless people who cannot run. I'm willing to be the sacrificial lamb and... Whatever it takes to get this done, I would do it to open up doors for many more people. And I promise you, I wouldn't be there till I'm 90 years of age. <laughs> I promise you that. <laughs> That's incredible. I think it's really audacious and brave, you know, now stepping away from your business. Give me, help us understand, like we're talking about breaking the code. You have multiple businesses but this is a full-time job it's like a lot of people go into business to give them the freedom yeah. to do life on their own terms mm -hmm. but now you're saying i'm going to visit 209 schools i'm making thousand calls every day like walk us through your day and what you're doing so we can really appreciate what this journey is like yeah uh the honest truth is that i um, not trying to discourage anybody who is trying to run for <laughs> office, but it's not very easy. It's, so, it's not something you wake up in the morning and say, oh, I want to run for, for United States Congress. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very, very challenging. First of all, you have to do your research. Uh, make sure that you know what you're talking about. And second, and most importantly, the issues that I'm talking about as we talk on the show, Break the Code, it's not, most of it is not my opinion. It's what 
the folks in the district are complaining about. Now, you talked about making phone calls. I make 200 phone calls in one day. And 200 might sound like it's not much, but... I don't like to answer one phone call. <laughs> <laughs> We're making 200. You, and if you look this up anywhere, it would you would see that it takes an average of eight hours to complete 200 phone calls, even if those calls are not answered by anybody. But this is part of the game. If you want to understand fully what the constituents are concerned about and want to get it changed, you have to talk to them because you are going to be their representative representation in Congress. So I have to make these calls. And if you look at my WhatsApp status, my Facebook page, my Instagram, uh, LinkedIn, you would see that I'm literally almost at every corner of the district at any one point because <laughs> I want to be able to hear... How many events did you go to yesterday? Or this weekend? Between Friday and, and, and Sunday. I was looking at your status. I'm like, he's over here. He's shaking football with him over here. He's doing this. Yeah. Like, you're all over the place. I am all over the place. Um, Which I've, is impressive. Yes. Because I want to be able to talk to the folks one-on-one. Mm -hmm. -on -one. I don't want to... You don't want secondhand information. information. And if you go to my website, mm -hmm. uh, the priorities I have there in that order are the list of issues in that critical fashion that is talked about by 99% of the constituents. Mm -hmm. I did not make none of them up. The number one on that list is education for a reason. Because if you speak to 9 out of 10 people in this district, they will tell you that education is a serious problem and that bothers me the most because these are our own children they will face competition from all over the world right. and if we are really serious about who's going to be the next governor the next president the next congressman the next lawyer the next teacher we have to be serious about this about about the foundation yes you see this in in other countries you have 15 year old kids building chips that we use here, mm -hmm. chips from China. We use them here on our phones and our microwaves and cameras and everything. Right. We have to be serious about that with our own children. I could tell you the United States is supposed to be the most powerful military on earth. But if we are not serious about the education of our own children, we're undermining them, the, the military might of the United States as well. But going back to what my challenges are, um, I have three children. I have to make sure that I'm taking care of them and being in their lives mm -hmm. as well. And I run my own business and I have to do this campaign in Monday through Friday and on weekends in conjunction with my business. So, but I still do try to get enough time to sleep and I do sleep. Good, good. I do sleep. But it's a very, very challenging journey i understand why most people are not trying because they have a life they have a family they have a job they have things to care about but if we want to see something different from the status quo then somebody else has to do it and that's why i'm doing it what was the moment when you said you know what i'm gonna run for congress like take us through that thought process that brought you to this place? This was actually in 2018 um, that I thought about this. Mm -hmm. um, it was a series of events because I'm very, I'm very moved and touched by two sets of people. Who are those people? Those people who in my perception or in my, my perspective are suffering the most. Okay. And that includes homeless people, mm. veterans who went and fought for this country, bled for this country, and saw them die for this country. When I see them on the streets, street corners, and very hot summer days and very frigid cold winter days. And I've been to under interstate highways 
to give food to the homeless folks and they, they're all over the place. Mm -hmm. I've talked to students and I've seen how they, they perform in schools and they're not what it was when, when I was in Cameroon looking at America from a distance. But at the same time, I see that we have the resources. Mm -hmm. I said, something has to be done. The other thing that moved me to do this was because I have been changed by the country. And I came in with $100 and I've had so many opportunities in this country to be who I am today. And I thought it was a perfect time for me to give back to the country that has made me who I am. And I said, maybe this is time for me to do this by doing something that would make me be a representation of the veterans, the students, the teachers, the homeless people, the, the special needs kids, our senior citizens, women, our environment, and things like that. Because I looked around and look at the statistics over the decades, it's the same thing over and over again because we have the same people, the same old players doing the same things over and over again. We complain, and yet nothing is changing. Also, I've had the privilege in this country as a citizen to enjoy freedom I didn't fight for, to fly into planes I did not build, to drive on roads I did not construct, to drive vehicles I didn't, I didn't build. So my question is, what is it that I have to leave behind for other people who would come to the country in some years to come, mm. who can also enjoy something I, I built or I fought for, mm. for them to enjoy. And I just feel like this is the moment for me to do this. This is my time. And I think that everyone should get involved with this and Absolutely. take us to a, next, next, a whole new level of the United States Congress. Because right now it's very, very dysfunctional, believe me. <laughs> now I think it's, you know, when I hear you saying this, but as I was doing my research, you're not just coming from, you know, a place where you're just talk. Because I did my research too. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and, you know, I know, I know Cameroonians. I know how our people can speak and they will say, well, why do you think you should serve here when you've not done anything back home? Did you get anything like that? I've had a lot of questions about that. Oh, you know, you could do something back at home. But I think that they didn't do enough research to also see that I have been to I, several schools, yes, several hospitals. Mm -hmm. and, and this is not for the cameras or anything. This was 14 years ago. This was a long time ago. A long yeah. time ago, yeah. and you've been doing this consistently. Yeah, and, and I did that because <laughs> I grew up in Cameroon, mm -hmm. poor. I used to walk seven miles on foot with no shoes on to go to school and back. And when I came here and saw that my life was a little bit different, it just made sense for me to go back to the same schools I went, to, I grew up in, the same neighborhoods, the same hospital I was born in, and feed everybody. Not that I was so rich, but it takes almost nothing to buy food, medication, books and pencils, to encourage those kids who are back there because they were in the exact same situation that I was. And interestingly, uh, sometime last year, I ran into one of the kids wow. whom I went home and gave them pens, pencils and those little school material. He came up to me and said, hi, uncle. Do you remember me? I was like, oh, you know, you know, this is a, this is an event center. I see hundreds of people every weekend. We're like, well, no, you came to, to Cameroon and gave us pens, pencils and books. You know, to me, that was a very... It was a wow moment because I never thought years from that, that time yeah. I would run into any of those people I, I get books and pencils right. to, which is actually really nothing, you know, if you look at it very closely. You know, but It's absolutely something. I think when someone has the opportunity to be seen and heard right. without them even asking for it, it really leaves a lasting impression. Um, Homelessness is something very dear to my heart. My son came out the womb saying when he started talking and he would see homeless people, he it would really like eat at his soul. He's such a sensitive kid. Right. And as much as I thought that I was, you know, hip to what the challenges were, he was like, 
we got to go help. And I have to say, he's helped change me to look at these challenges and be more intentional about giving. And so when I've been asking and trying to learn about homelessness, sometimes it's not just that you gave them $5. It's the fact that you did not ignore them. Right. That you, because so many of us can do that, but how many of us are? So it's... Yeah. Um, can you tell your son, it's a song? Yes. Can you tell him to sign up for the campaign? Absolutely, I'm sure he will. That. I'm sure he will. Yes. <laughs> he sounds like he could be good, a good campaign manager too. <laughs> so tell him to sign on. Absolutely, Let's absolutely. Go. Uh, he'll watch this. Amani, make sure you sign up, okay? Hey, sign up, Amani. <laughs> what, is it Amani? Yes. Make sure you sign up, Amani. <laughs> um, well, thank you for what you're doing. Now, when we're talking about breaking the code, we've talked about your entrepreneurial mm -hmm. experience, you know, pivoting several times, taking these big jumps into unknown territory. Right. What would you say to someone who is on the edge? They're thinking about it, right? They're thinking, I want to run for Congress. I want to start a new business. But I'm hearing the voices of all the 10 people whom I spoke to, nine said, don't do it. But right. only one stood with me on that journey. How do you find the internal fortitude to make the leap? That's, you know, that's, that's a very, very um, question that's actually very, very dear to me. And I'll explain to you why. Okay. Because I wrote a whole book about this. And in that book, there is a chapter in there that says, follow your instincts. Mm -hmm. And you did mention something that's really, really critical, which most people don't. Most people don't seem to always make use of. You said that voice mm -hmm. in your head. Now, let me explain. Every single day, each and every one of us processes thousands of information in your head. Right from what you see, what you're thinking, uh, what you're hearing, you know, and so on. But there's always that little angel in your voice that tells you to do this. Out of the many millions of processes that the brain actually processes every second. But you have one angelic voice, but a very tiny voice. For, for, for some reason, it's a tiny voice. For some reason, it's so it's, easy to silence. Yeah, so easy yes. to push it down, silence it. But that one voice of yours that tells you to do that, that's the voice you should listen to. Mm. That voice of yours tells you, pick up a clipboard, run for office. Run. Don't that walk. Voice, don't run. Walk. Run. <laughs> the voice that tells you, yes, yeah, start this business. Go for it. Mm -hmm. Go. Even though people will tell you, of course, but what is yourself telling you? Because no, no matter how much I know you as a friend, or you know me as a friend, I'm the only one that knows who I am. Yeah. Remember that song? I know who I am, that Nigerian gospel yes. yeah. song. You're the only one who knows exactly who you are. Because you're in bed with yourself at the end of the night, in the middle of the night, if your little angel happens to wake you up, telling you, oh, when you wake up in the morning, do this. Take that exam. Take that leap. Mm. Jump. Do this. Just listen and follow your instincts. Because people are going to tell you otherwise. And, the, and in that book, I did explain that imagine that there's some of us who don't know ourselves that well. Right. And we're the ones trying to tell other people what they should do <laughs> about themselves. Mm. Like, how mm. ironical is that? Hey. <laughs> I don't know what your dreams are. Right. And sometimes I can't even, I can't even envisage your dreams. The things that might be so impossible for me, my body is impo but could be what's possible for you. Mm -hmm. When I started, when I, <laughs> when I was tearing down the garage to put up a, an event center, Everybody thought I was crazy, but no one saw my vision. I was the only one who saw it. So to whoever you are watching or listening, whatever you want to start, do it. Do it. 
that first voice that came to your mind or in your head telling you to take that move, make it. Make it. <laughs> make it. Right. Don't. I know sometimes we second guess, mm -hmm. but the very first instinct that tells you, follow it. Right. But for a lot of people, it's not just do it, make it. Mm -hmm. It's I don't have the money. That's a big one. I know running for Congress, we, we need a lot of money. I'm, you see, I've said we now because mm -hmm. this is going to be our thing together. Yeah. Okay. So we need a lot of money for this, right? Mm -hmm. We need money to start businesses. We mm -hmm. need, um, some people think they need investors. Talk to that person as well. Well, I wrote a book about that. <clears throat> Gabriel. And, <laughs> <laughs> and get this. Yeah. Here's the title. How to Turn Small Resources into Big Dreams. I heard this a lot. Oh, I don't have the money. Mm -hmm. I don't have the energy. I don't have the time. I don't have the resources and so on. But most 500 Fortune, uh, Fortune 500 companies, most people who are influential nowadays, most of them did not start with something that big. No. I came here with a hundred bucks. Literally five $20 bills clipped is what I flew in with. And I use eighty five dollars of it at the airport, which I should I shouldn't have. By the way. <laughs> my instinct, I didn't follow my instincts. <laughs> but you don't have to have a whole lot mm -hmm. to begin with. What you need is the passion. Is to say, look, I am going to do this, mm -hmm. regardless of what problems or tribulations I run into. I will do this. Rain, sun storms, fights, disappointments, you name them. I will do it. On January 4, I, I told you, I sent the first WhatsApp text message saying, look, I'm running for United States Congress in 2024. On January 4th. Of 2023. Of 2023. I had zero dollars to the campaign, zero. No volunteers, no money. Nothing. It was just me. And your dream. And my dream. But four or five months down the road, we've raised $70,000. Incredible. Seventy thousand, And these are people who probably did not believe in it from the, from the beginning. But some people did. They trusted in me and they gave me $5, $10, $100. And now we are at 70000 And everywhere I go, the energy is there. Mm. You can tell that people are supporting the cause. Mm -hmm. But I started off with zero dollars. And now I'm talking to breaking the code. Yeah, so we need to raise some money because I don't know what business we can run with 70,000. I know, yeah. <laughs> Thank you to everyone who has yes. donated yes. to Gabriel for Congress. Yes. Go to gabrielforcongress.com. Yes. You can donate there. Um, if you're not on his WhatsApp status, you know, follow him on right. Instagram. Um, but this is not just for people in this district. This is for all of us because right. when we can elevate our fellow compatriots, our fellow humans, um, by bringing one person to the table mm -hmm. who can make a difference for everyone, Correct. then we're really impacting the world. So I'm very excited about your vision, your vision for this district. Thank you. I'm excited about seeing you in the halls of Congress. Yes. Um, I'm excited about hearing names like yours, Jimmy Butt. You know? Congressman Jimmy Butt. Congressman Jimmy Butt. Like, learn that name, yes. okay? Yes. Um, we've learned all kinds of names now it's time for yeah, for one of those and i i would want to add that um when we we all grow by lifting each other up Absolutely. we we can't we we cannot use the word we rise when other people are falling mm. it has to be all of us and I, I've, I've always made this known that this campaign is not about me it wasn't about me it's not about me and it's never going to be about me it's about all of us because 
when you have someone who is the voice of people who have been forgotten, it means that I would go into Congress with a moral responsibility to think about the people who put me in office, to think about the thousands of people I, have, I spoke to and they told me in person that these are the issues we're facing with our sickle cell kids, our special need kids, our students, our senior citizens, senior citizens our entrepreneurs, our veterans, our nurses, and everybody who is struggling to uplift themselves out of poverty in, mm -hmm. this country, in this country. It's about all of us. It's about everyone, not just me. I've, 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 I've seen people who think I'm just trying to make a name. My name is Gabriel Jimmy, but <laughs> I'm not trying to make another one, you know? Yeah. Uh, but it's really about the folks who, who most people don't even know who their congressman is. When, it's, when, I, when you ask them, who's your congressman? Oh, we have no idea. Because these folks don't talk to that many people. They buy their way in. But we want all of us grow as one big American family. And all of us are succeeding. It makes me sad if the, the field is not that level. You have a very affluent community in the same district and another community literally drowning in poverty. I don't like that. Absolutely. So we want to see change. We want to even out the playing field. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, really bring these disparities to light. Yeah. This is what I vote for. Gabriel. Gabriel. Congress. Make sure you go out to the polls. Make sure you're registered to vote. If you're not registered to vote, right. you can volunteer for this yes. from anywhere, anywhere, anywhere in the world. Yes. You can share this on your WhatsApp status. You can put out a link and say, "Give five dollars, give ten dollars, give a hundred, give a thousand, give ten, Correct. give a hundred thousand." Because we need, we, we need, need the resources. We need the resources. Yes, and the reality. We need the money. We, <laughs> we need need the do. resources to win. Yes, yes. And like she said. Gabriel for Congress is the code. And you could share. You could share this link to five people who share to another five people, to another five, because they said it takes a village to do what? Raise a child. There you go. Absolutely. Um, well, thank you again. I I learned so much. I learned so much. Your hey. story is incredible. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I know this is not just your sacrifice. It's your wife, your children, sure, yeah. your businesses even. Um, thank you for putting yourself out there. Sure. Thank you for making time to come on. No, Rick it was actually code. a pleasure for yes. me to finally meet you and talk to Absolutely. you and keep up the good work. Thank you. Because codes are breaking. Codes are breaking and codes can be broken. broken. Yes. Absolutely. So thank you guys for watching. Um, once again, go to Gabriel for Congress. Follow him in all your social media channels. And make sure you're watching break the code, and listening on all your streaming platforms. And give her a five-star review. <laughs> yes. Like, share, and subscribe. Thank you, guys.